unidentifiable flying object. <laughs> UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Sightings of UFOs. Something out there. <laughs> Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be a thing. A UFO. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of UFO No, your break from the propaganda. The bad news, the treasonous politicians, time to get elevated and speculate the shit out of First World War era UFO sightings. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into a whole bunch. I like going through the old shit, so that's what we're going to do. I'm flying solo today, cruising at about 96,000 feet, and it's clear skies, baby. By the way, you know, I know I never do this because I just, I feel like I know you all, but I'm Ben. I'm a wannabe ufologist, wannabe, a lot of things, but I'm a skeptic. I'm a believer. I'm all of those things. I'm open-minded. I'm agnostic about a lot of this stuff, and that's the the stance I take on it, but I'm also, I don't want to get duped. I don't want to get fooled. So I, I look at this with a with a very skeptical eye, uh, but today we're going to go into the old school stuff that I love. Uh, I'm just a big fan of heroes, and when I was growing up, my dad's a veteran. When I was growing up, I watched a lot of war documentaries, you know, the History Channel, stuff like that, and I've always been a big fan of the old, uh, the ace pilots, You know, all that stuff is just fascinating to me. And so to think of possible UFOs and potential of uh, advanced technology floating around at the same time when we're talking about the early 1900s, flight's been around uh, 10 years. Anyways, we're going to get into it. It's great. I love it. So uh, anyways, if you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review. Five stars looks excellent. Next to all the rest, so make sure and throw that up there. Hit that subscribe button, the follow button. Catch every new episode the moment it comes out if you're watching on the YouTube. Doesn't matter where you're watching, where you're listening. Hit that subscribe, hit that follow, uh, hit the notification bell so that way you don't miss anything. And then also, while you're at it, click that Portal to All Things UFO No link in the show notes. Find ways of supporting the show like our merch shop, full of great stuff like hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, all kinds of stuff. Tag us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Show us how badass you look in your gear because I want to see it. Uh, I want to see you in that gear. And we got two different shops, so check it out. We'll, uh, again, links are in the show notes. You determine what quality you like better, then go through that shop. And we got some new deals coming with our uh, Tin Foil Militia member, Casey Armadillo, who might be helping us out with some merch. Thank you, dude. Uh, so soon coming big things. Uh, If you're into Bitcoin, listen on apps like Fountain to earn what's called sats or satoshis. While you listen, 100 million sats makes up one Bitcoin. Turn your hours of listening into money. That's simple, and you can boost the podcast while you do it. It's super awesome. Great thing to do if you're into that type of stuff. Uh, Lastly, of course, you can support the podcast by supporting our partners, Clarkson CBD Company, for excellent CBD products. Telling you, we got the best, guys. Uh, Subscribe at, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Scribed. At uh, it is a great Audible alternative. I love it. No credits needed. Fourteen ninety five a month. You get the full library, and when you use our link, you get sixty days free when you sign up. And of course, Buzzsprout. If you want to start your own podcast, which I think everybody should, especially if you're opinionated, why not get it out there? Uh, start with Buzzsprout. That's who I go through. We love it. And uh, when you sign up through our link, you get a $20 Amazon gift card just for signing up when you start your podcast on Buzzsprout. That's simple. And of course, of course, if you want commercial-free episodes, you want all my loyalty, you want more content like my take on news, not the stuff in the corrupt media, but the stuff that you don't hear about, about AI technology, quantum computing, along with all of what the government bastards like NASA and the CIA are up to, well, then you just join the tinfoil militia, and here's how to do it. You can buy us a Romulan ale or two or three. 
They're only five bucks each. They're made from only the finest Khaled secretions on the Veronac Colony. Leave a note so we can share and toast to you on the show. And, of course, donate at patreon.com, the OG place to support us. Uh, patreon.com slash UFO No Podcast and leave us a note as well. Leave comments. Join our Discord server. Those are all great ways to support the show. Or, of course, you can give a direct donation through PayPal. Every donation gets your name permanently etched on the supporters plaque at HQ and a shout out on the show. Monthly sustained donations make you an active member with access to tier members. And every single episode is brought to you by the tin foil badass tin foilists who support this podcast. And here they are. I believe I see militia forming. Tin foil. Militia. Stop militia. The tin foil militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. Gay bomb, baby. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's get right into it, shall we? So these days, the feed, which is just everything, everything out in the ether, the internet, the, the social media. I'm just gonna. We're just gonna lump it in. The feed is full of UFO videos from all over the world. Politicians, celebrities are all boarding the disclosure train. Hashtag UFO Twitter is a thing, and I love it all. I think it's amazing. If it's legit, these sightings, these whatnot, then it adds to the credibility. If not, it's content. I love it all. I love it all. But my point is, it's hard to know what's real and what's not real. I mean, what's real anyway? We talked about on the the uh, uh, Damn It Slenderman episode. Uh what is reality? What is real? Our perception makes up reality, right? Well, anyways, what's on video with cameras and whatnot, that we can debate is real or not because there's a lot of fuckery these days. Anyone can get an app to make a video, a UFO video. I mean, you could go download an app right now that you pop it up anywhere you want and it'll make a UFO show up. It's amazing. People make it out like there's stigma involved in UFOs now. I don't believe that for a minute. I don't believe that for a minute. It's celebrated everywhere you go. It's amazing. It's great stuff. Anyone can learn computer graphics. Anyone can learn the technology to do this stuff. And the technology and the software has never been more accessible to make anything look like anything. I mean, look at movies these days. It's, it's incredible. I love it. It's Don't get me wrong. I love it. It's phenomenal. But on the other side of this, it's easy to get duped, right? So I keep looking at the old stuff as comparisons, uh, mainly because it was harder, if not impossible, to fake media of that kind. And also because there really was a stigma about sightings and encounters. So people were less likely to go public with a lie because most people, even if you were telling the truth, they wouldn't believe you anyways. I mean, a lot of people, when you tell about it, an experience of some kind, when it's out there, which a lot of them are, then yeah, people are going to be skeptical. But if you say you saw something, oh, well, that's not that's not that bad. But then you start adding in, you know, oh, I saw this and it was a creature. And, you know, it's just it builds and it builds and it builds. But with that in mind, we're going to take a look at these some. There's a lot. So we're only going to take a, you know, a, brief look at some of the pre-World War I, before 1914, encounters that happened. Again, keep in mind, flight had only been around for a little over 10 years, so it was not a casual thing to see a plane flying, let alone something weird like a saucer or a cigar, a cigar, cigar! So, let's go back to 1910 off the coast of Normandy when the crew of a French fishing vessel saw an object descend and crash into the ocean before disappearing under the water. Around the same time in St. Marin, Cornwall, England, two local residents reported seeing a red object moving overhead. Among the clouds was several dwarf-like creatures inside the object looking down on them. My question is how? 
how did these people see if this object is moving in the clouds, how in 1910 with, I would imagine, not very great binoculars is able to see several dwarf-like creatures inside an object inside a cloud. How? Riddle me this. Let me know in the comments. I want to know. How do you think that's possible? I, am I missing something? You know, if there's, if there's some kind of spyglass that I didn't know about in 1910, that they're like, well, duh, dude. Here's how they did it. Then fucking show me. I want to know. I want to know. Point it out. Show me my stupidity, please. In Connawillick, Guyana, according to a report in Curious Encounters by Lauren Coleman, who was a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there was a local magistrate, which is basically a police officer, was prospecting for gold near the Potato River when he saw several short creatures with reddish-brown fur staring back at him for several moments before backing away into the jungle. Now, that's not a UFO. That's tiny red creatures. What do you think those were? You think it was the dino beaver from Skinwalker Ranch? Was it Bigfoot's babies? Does a brown fur, or does a fur turn more brown as it gets older? I wonder. Uh, near Estela, Navarra, in Spain, from Iker Jimenez, in the book Cursed Paradise, a cow herder, Ricardo Jimenez. Relation? Uh, Iker Jimenez writes a book. Ricardo Jimenez is the person in the book. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Was making his way back on horseback one night when he noticed a figure on the roadside. He stopped Got off of his horse, made his way over to the creature, seemed to be in pain. And when he got a little bit closer, he could see the horrible distorted features and long extremities that freaked him out to the point that he turned around and ran back to his horse, leaving this poor creature in distress. Terrible. No wonder nobody likes humans. Not even humans like humans, generally. So it, it's kind of, you know, it's just kind of crazy to think of how we treat people and then we like, we're like, oh, I hope the, the aliens are going to be peaceful. It's like, well, we have a terrible, terrible track record. So, you know, if it's anything based on that, and I know a lot of people say that, oh, if it's anything based on how humans treat each other creatures, we're fucked, which I agree with that. But I just have a hard time understanding why, like an alien race, and I pointed this out before, I have a hard time understanding why an alien race out in the cosmos, which is infinite after building up the ability to travel anywhere in the cosmos whether it be interdimensionally or simply just quickly through space i don't know space travel why why us why fuck with us and why are they crashing and dying on earth I think this, something like this, this one, uh, you know, this horrible, distorted feature, creature, and then reddish brown fur. I don't think those are aliens necessarily. Maybe as much as Bigfoot might be an alien. I think these could be interdimensional creatures that get kind of lumped into the same bag of things. Who knows? So I, I'm leaning towards cryptid, cryptoid. Than, uh, than alien on that. At least on those two. Let's continue on. Another sighting in Invercargill, Southland, New Zealand, involved a cigar-shaped craft and a figure in the doorway on the side of the craft who appeared to be shouting in an unknown language. Which that could... That could be German, right? An unknown language. Well, to the person who's watching, again, when everything is perception, to the individual who saw this, an unknown language could have been Chinese. An unknown language could have been African. Is African a language? Swahili? 
Uh, it could have been anything. Could have been any unknown language, as in any earthly language. And the craft, being 1910, from this individual who may not have ever seen an airplane before, anything flying, 1910, 10 years after flight, who knows in New Zealand if they had ever seen anything fly, aside from maybe a balloon or a kite. So it's interesting to think about what they may have really been seeing and what this person may have really heard. I'm leaning towards uh, Pig Latin. Another sighting around 9 a.m. on 12th, January 12th, 1910, Chattanooga, Tennessee, around 1,000 local residents saw a craft moving in a strange way. Around 15 minutes later in Huntsville, Alabama, according to a report by Frank Edwards, a very similar object was seen moving in a very similar fashion. So what's, what's the strange... Is that what the is that what the similar fashion is? It was strange. Again, keep in mind the time frame, 1910. I'm going to keep bringing this up. This is in the early days of flight. Flight had only been done 10 years prior or something like that around there. Very 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 new. And so, what is strange? Well, a helicopter would be strange to them in that time. Not now. Uh, An airplane in general may have been strange that they hadn't seen one before, but not now. So, what is strange? Uh, What does strange mean? It just means unknown, right? And in 1910, there was a lot of things that were unknown. A lot of things that were unknown. Three days later, in Knoxville, Tennessee, another almost identical object, strange object, was seen. Later that same day, according to a report in a local newspaper in the early evening in Fulton County, Arkansas, Myrtle Lee and her brother Jack claimed to have seen a bright object hovering just above the trees. Myrtle said that the craft was silver-colored and shaped like a zeppelin. No windows or wings. And in case you're unfamiliar, Zeppelin is, well, you should know what it is. It's Led, Led Zeppelin. Go look at the album. The, uh, the Hindenburg, that was a Zeppelin. They watched it for several minutes before it started up and then disappeared in an instant. Just disappeared. At around 8 a.m., January 20th, in Memphis, Tennessee, according to research files of Lucius Farish, several people saw multiple objects overhead all moved independently of each other. So a couple things to keep in mind. Again, as I repeated numerous times already, flight is new. Flight with lights? I think that's probably even newer. So I'm not sure what that was. Could it have been some kind of technology being developed at that time? Remember when Ed blew our minds with uh, with drones? Find out how long drones? Uh Could it have been drones? Could it have been something else? All moving independently of each other. That is interesting. Because that's, you know, it would be harder. I mean, you know, again, it's hard to know if we're not there. If they're really far apart, if they're close together, but if they're moving independently, it, it generally assumes that's multiple crafts, individual crafts. That'd be hard to do, especially then. I would assume I'm not, I don't know. Those, I'll... Clearly a lot going on in the skies at the time. According to a report in Doubt Magazine, which was like kind of a supernatural magazine, at just before midnight on February 5th in Greer, Idaho, which is only, I believe, 
uh, an hour away from us over here in the LC Valley. In Greer, Idaho, a local resident on the Whitney River reported seeing an object move through the sky that was beyond the capability of known earthly craft. Again, that's not saying much in 1910. Known earthly craft were biplanes. So, I mean, it wouldn't have been hard to outdo that. Any, virtually any craft that was not publicly displayed or talked about in any way would have been considered outside the capability of known earthly craft if they didn't know any better. Anything. And think about how hard or easy that would be uh, be able to do by today's standards. So is there some kind of time travel involved? That's always been my question. Is in this time frame, is it more time travel? Look, I'm obsessed with early days of the world wars. So if I could go back in a UFO or a craft of some kind and observe, even from the sky, especially from the sky, observe the battles going on for myself, I would. So is there some time travel going on here? Could that could that be what it is? Maybe. Several weeks later, in spring of 1910, in Violetville, Maryland, a young boy, Lawrence Crone, first one to be named, by the way, in all this witnesses, uh, was walking near a baseball field with his mom a short distance away when he saw a blimp or cigar-shaped object 100 feet long Metallic exterior hovering just above a pine tree around 200 feet away from him. Along the side of the object was a line of rectangular glass-looking windows in various colors, where he could see 20 humanoid figures with the heads of a pigeon wearing a weird-shaped helmet, no nose or ears, but two round spots for eyes, covered in a soft-looking gray or light-colored gown like fur. Weird. Could have been a uniform of some kind, a, a costume of some kind. Interesting. While Lawrence Crone was looking, two young guys walked past, called out to the creatures, pointed to the craft, and then got freaked out and ran away. The object started to rise into the air, move away slowly when his mother caught up to him. She stood with him, and they watched the object until it disappeared. So 20 humanoid figures, heads of pigeons, wearing helmets. My question is, how did he decipher what was head and what was helmet? What if it was all helmet? All a pigeon-shaped helmet. No nose, no ears, which you wouldn't have a nose or, or at least ears with a helmet on. Two round spots for eyes, those could be goggles. The pigeon heads could have been, if you think about today's pilots, the elongated nose of the face mask. Mm? Mm? Could it have been a pilot? Could they have been, these 20 figures? Have been soldiers of some kind wearing oxygen masks. Again, if this person, these two people, father and son, have no idea, and he's a young boy, he's not going to know what technology exists in war or not. I don't even know if there were oxygen masks by then. But think about that. That could very easily be some kind of a suit It said fur, but it might not have been fur. It's far away. He's looking up at it. I don't know, man. Could have been anything. Similar object was seen in the early evening of May 4th in Sir Naughty, Ukraine. Sir Naughty! According to a report by Ion Habona, an object moved in a way unlike a standard aircraft, which... Again, by the way, back then, 
not seeing much. How many standard aircraft are running around after 10 years of airplane of flight even being around? An estimated that it was around 300 feet across. It remained in sight for around three seconds. A little over two weeks later, across the Atlantic Ocean in Alma, Illinois, a similar object was reported by a resident several weeks after that. Back over the Atlantic in Vansbro, Sweden, another sighting of a similar object. The witness in this case said the craft was disc-shaped. Another sighting of a disc-shaped object was reported around the same time in the summer of 1910 in Vernal, Utah. According to the report, the witness was riding on horseback when it became extremely agitated, causing him to get off. When he did, he noticed a disc-shaped object with a row of lights around the edge hovering a short distance above the ground, making a low buzzing sound. Then it rose into the air and streaked away. Around the same time in Jewett, Texas, around 9 p.m., six women looking up at the sky reported seeing an object traveling across the sky and moving in a strange fashion. Again, everything moving in the sky is going to be weird. In 1910, literally everything in the sky flying that's not a cloud, a bird, is going to be strange. So are these cases of mistaken identity? I mean, a lot of times in like ancient world type things, I, I like biblical stuff, I say mistaken identity when it comes to like tornadoes and whatnot, the finger of God coming and picking up a guy. Well, that could be a tornado. Picking up a guy, throwing him three miles away. Or whoever knows. Who knows? I mean, shit, it's moved cows. It's moved vehicles. It can pick up a, a dude. Especially in ancient times when supposedly people were smaller. Or I guess that's the idea. Like, wasn't Jesus like three and a half feet tall or something? Maybe not. I'm pretty, you know, the accuracy and family guy of Jesus being three and a half feet tall, I just feel like they did their homework on that, you know? At the end of July in Normandy, France, an elongated object was seen moving across the sky at great speed and making unusual movements. Again, great speed is anything moving faster than a bird. And making unusual movements is anything not a bird. I'm not saying there was secret government craft running around then. I'm just saying we don't know. We just don't know. Around a month later, around 9 p.m., August 30th in New York, according to an account in Flying Saucer Review, an almost identical object was seen by around 100 people. Three weeks later, also in New York, This time during the middle of the afternoon, multiple residents saw a shiny disc-shaped object move over the city. The next evening, in the Dunkirk region of New York, a disc-shaped object landed briefly in a remote area before taking off and disappearing into the distance. On October 27th, at around 10 a.m. in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, Canada, According to the research files of Richard Hall and his book From Airships to Arnold, a preliminary catalog of UFO reports in the early 20th century, a scar-shaped object with bright red and green lights at each end and a white headlight moved over the town at an altitude of only 600 feet. A cigar-shaped object. You know, that's, that's... The cigar-shaped object is a very interesting one because that one is seen a lot, especially in uh, older times. Like the 18, what is it? The 18-something sighting. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was, um, maybe it was earlier than that. It was like 1600s or something. I thought that was an 1800-something depiction of um, of a, a UFO battle is what I thought it was, but I could be wrong about that, but I'm going to check it out real quick because I can't remember a depiction of a UFO battle. 
1561. That's what it was. 15, I was way off. 1561 Nuremberg. It's the big drawing that appeared. It was in, uh, they called a broadsheet, a news article that was printed in 1561. Describes a mass sighting of celestial phenomena. And a lot of it was spheres, cylinders, odd-shaped objects moving erratically. Who knows what they were? Who knows what they were? But is that similar? Is that what that was, except now it's got lights? Who knows? Several weeks later, in early December 1910, Massachusetts, another anomalous object was sighted by multiple people. And around a week later, just outside Listowel in Count, County Kerry, Ireland, two men noticed two lights out of them around a mile away. At first, they believed the lights were a lighthouse. But as they got closer, they could tell the lights were moving up and down and expanding. As the lights were expanding, they saw a radiant being with human form appear in front of them in each light for several moments before disappearing. The next year, 1911, slidings, uh, slidings, sightings slowed down a little bit, but there's still some worth mentioning. According to the book Modern Mysteries of Britain by Janet and Colin Board, in 1911, a resident of the Isle of Man saw a large group of, ty- of little beings dressed in red and marching as soldiers. Just off the coast of Reykjavik in Iceland, the whaler ship Orkney Bell was sailing through icy waters when they almost crashed into a ship that appeared out of the mist. There was no crew on board the vessel. There was something very weird about the way it moved on the water. You know, and and I know that these are incredibly vague. And that's because (laughs) they're incredibly vague. That's what these sightings are. That's why it's all fun to just speculate as what it might be. Anybody who looks at this, I mean, look, I, you know, I think it'd be great to look at this with a scientific eye. But like what, what scientifically is there to break down here? Well, there's nothing. It's all hearsay. It's all, you know, move strangely weird. I mean, it's it's there's nothing scientific, I feel like, to be able to break down here. So it has to be all speculation as to one, if these are real, two, what they are. Human, alien. Three. Well, I guess that's not three. That's just two. Are they real? And if they're real, what are they? I mean, that's really it. Another encounter from England happened several weeks later, this time in Chisbury, Whitshire, according to an article by Charles Tilden Smith in the British science journal Nature. Smith himself saw two fan or triangular-shaped heavy shadows that were cast on the clouds above him that he believed were the shadows of objects somewhere else in the sky. So, two fan or triangular shaped heavy shadows in the clouds above him that he believed were objects that were casting shadows onto the clouds from above. That is interesting. I mean, it makes you wonder. I just, it again, at this time, it's so hard for me to, it's not like I'm a smart guy, but we have a lot of access to information that we can go and look. What would cause the casting of a shadow on a cloud? Hey, Google. And then you can look it up and find a whole bunch of resources that would talk about that. In fact, that's what I do for this show. I look up a lot of stuff and say, hey, I want to talk about this, and then put a bunch of shit together. Thank goodness for the internet. So without having 
access to information. How much real knowledge was going into the speculation of what these things were when people were saying, well, I think this was a, an object that was casting a shadow on a cloud. How much do you think? I mean, even now, if I heard that, I'd be like, how do you know that? So in 1910, 1911, I guess, I'd be asking that as well. Even more so, where'd you get your information from? How'd you know, how do you know that? I mean, how would they know that something in the clouds could cast shadows on clouds? If, uh, I suppose, I suppose they would know that. I suppose they would know that. I don't know, man. I just think the average random person in 1910 is just not, I just feel is not, but maybe I'm wrong that they're not going to be thinking that, you know, that, uh, that out there outside the box to be thinking it was a craft casting a shadow. You know what I mean? Most people, if it's not religious, they're going to try and explain it away as something ordinary. Most people. At least that's my assessment of what the majority of people would do in 1910. I don't really know. I'm a dumbass. Later in the summer, 1911, in Derbyshire, also in England, six-year-old Mary B. was on a farm when she saw a dark cigar-shaped object a short distance away hovering just above the ground with at least one occupant in a cabin section of the vehicle. All right. How did a six-year-old girl in 1911 that I I am I am super super positive does no knows nothing about aircraft? Because again, this is in the early days of flight in general. How would she know? an aircraft can even carry someone, let alone what the cabin section of the vehicle would be. I call bullshit. I don't know. I hate to say that about a six-year-old girl, but I think mistaken identity. How does she know that stuff? How does she know that stuff? Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. If a six-year-old girl in 1911 knew plenty about vehicle, you know, a cabin vehicle of an airplane, tell me. I just don't think she would. On July 2nd, according to an account in the July 3rd, 1911 edition of the Windsor Record, an object was reported hovering over Chatham Township outside Windsor, Ontario, Canada, for several days. The object descended to a short distance above the ground where it remained in full view for several moments, then made a whirring sound, started to glow brightly before taking off and disappearing into the wood, uh, uh, disappearing into the sky. Glowing brightly. Now that, to me, the whirring sound, the glowing brightly. To me, that's advanced technology that could be from aliens. But everything else is super, super low-key. Could be anything. But that one, the bright sound, the bright glow and the whirring sound says to me, charging up of energy of some kind and the disappearing. Could be teleportation, could be a lot of things. So I like that one. In early 1912, on a farm in Vancouver, British Columbia, again, another six-year-old, Abram Penner, saw a craft land near where he was playing. Later, he told his dad that a group of men came out of the craft and examined his body, showing particular interest in his hands, saying they have different hands than we do, as well as round feet, short legs, and no knees or elbows. 
He went on that these men operate on mind power, and because of this, he understood their language. Okay, again, we're talking about a six-year-old boy. A six-year-old boy. Saying that these men operate on mind power, and because of this, I can understand their language. What? What? Was I just a complete dumbass at six? I don't think I would be thinking that. Oh, these men, they operate on mind power. What? What six-year-old talks like that? Again, I call bullshit. I don't know. But according to this account, Penner's father told him not to speak to anyone about it. Around the same time, across the Atlantic Ocean, on the island of Muck in Highland, Scotland, must be a nice place, two young boys were walking along the beach searching for driftwood when they saw two small men wearing green vests. The men turned their attention to the two boys, speaking to them in both English and Gaelic, which Gaelic is the Celtic language spoken in the mostly highlands and the islands, western Scotland, uh, asking them what they were doing. Behind the figures, the two boys could see a boat, quote-unquote, a boat with a strange woman on it beckoning them to approach. They declined the invite and turned to leave. But according to the report, they were later found sitting on a rock somewhere nearby. Yeah. All right. Two young boys walking. See men, small men wearing vests. <laughs> Which I don't know why why that makes them so weird. Small men wearing vests. I, I don't know. But either way. And a strange woman beckons them. How old are the boys? And how strange did the woman look? I'm curious. Did the boys see her? And the reason why they were later found sitting on the rock in shock is because they were contemplating why they had sex with an alien woman? Mm. Or why maybe they didn't? They're regretting it? Ah, we should have done it, man. Or maybe they're like, we shouldn't have done that. (laughs) Who knows? Another account from early 1912. Again, by Janet and Colin Board. A man and his mother just outside Gallipolis, Ohio. Or is it Gallipoli? Is the S silent? I don't know. They were picking berries in a clearing when a bizarre dark object descended out of the sky, hovering just ahead of them slightly above the trees. The pair started to walk away when they noticed a figure a short distance away, walking parallel to them, wearing some kind of dark clothing, was bulky with no visible neck. After a little bit, they started to run. When they looked back, the figure and the object were gone. Let's establish something here. These are all unidentified flying objects and unidentified aerial or anomalous, whatever the fuck they're calling them. All of them are UFOs, UAP. I'm not arguing that. The debate is whether these are otherworldly craft or something terrestrial, something earthly. Again, I'm going to reiterate again. In these reports, we are dealing with people that have a very vague concept of flight. Some of them, most of them, have probably never seen an aircraft before. So everything in the air is going to seem unusual. Anything that's not a bird. And what else is in the sky? I mean, obviously stars, okay, whatever. I'm just saying. Everything is going to seem unusual 
and fast. These people only had cars for 20 years. How fast were cars going in 1910? 35 miles an hour? At the fastest, maybe? How fast were they going? I'm curious. How fast did cars go in... Did cars... How fast did cars go in 1910? I'm curious because... Holy shit. 85? Eighty-five? The fastest production car. In nineteen ten. That's crazy. That's crazy. I did not know that. In nineteen ten, topped out at thirty five. I'm sorry, nineteen nineteen oh eight. The average speed was 35. Yeah, okay. All right, that's what I thought. So the fastest car was going 80. And so in 1910, they could go around 50. And that's the Rolls Royce. So we're talking about like the top cars in in the time. So, yeah. So, anyways. All right. So, somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. Uh, Again, so like I'm saying, they've only had vehicles, uh, uh, cars, 20 years, flight, 10 years. So, everything is going to seem fast. Anything going faster than that, and anything is going to seem strange. And again, as I mentioned again, Ed Bloor Mines a while back when he asked about how drones, old drones are. 1898, Nikola Tesla was displaying radio-controlled boats at Madison Square Garden. Freaking people out. People thought it was magic. Thought he had telekinesis. Other people thought it was some kind of trained monkey inside the the boat, believe it or not. By 1936, there was an official U.S drone program so could these things be drones I think there's a very real possibility that yes they could be but let's continue on in Cologne Germany Cologne whatever Ernest Dickoff was playing in his bedroom with what trying to get his dick off ah! was playing in his bedroom when he felt a sudden urge to turn around. When he did, he saw two humanoid men standing near his bed. He watched them for several moments before they simply faded away. Another encounter from Rebus Magazine took place near the River Volga in Russia. According to the report, Mr. Dickin, Ditchkin, Dickskin, (laughs) I don't know. Uh, and an unnamed friend were going home in separate sleds along the river when two men came up, two strange men came up to the men near the roadside. They came to a stop. Dick Skin offered the men a ride, at least as far as uh, to his home. The men accepted and got in. Shortly after, one of the men told Dick Skin that the storm was going to get worse, and instead of going to his hometown, he should go to a town nearer and spend the night. He didn't know about any nearby town other than his, but without really thinking about it, Dick Skin agreed and changed course. After a little while, one of the men said he could see the town ahead, and there in the distance, Dick Skin could see a brightly lit metropolis, is how he described the likes of which he had never seen before. Keep in mind, it's a very rural area, I'm sure, He's probably never seen that many lights, but not saying that this wasn't a craft. I'm just saying, you know. As they got closer, both men felt a bizarre and sudden sense of terror. 
At the same time, the two humanoids vanished. Confused and scared, the men turned their sleds around and headed back home. When they looked back, the lit-up city was gone. Was the city some kind of craft with a lot of lights? You know, like uh, an aircraft carrier kind of uh, situation where you can see lights all around it? Was it an attempted abduction? And what is an attempted abduction anyways? Why do why do they not fully abduct? I wonder. One of my favorite first World War encounters is from the Red Baron. Baron Manfred von Richthofen. One of the most feared fighter pilots of his era. In a story mind you, told eight decades after it supposedly happened by his wingman, who was with Red Baron at the time. It's claimed that uh, they not only saw a craft, but they shot it down. Obviously, there's a lot of speculation here because it's secondhand. Someone who was with him, not the Baron himself, and of course, it's 80 years later. But the story goes... Shortly after dawn on March 13th, 1917, Baron Manfred von Richthofen took off from Western Belgium accompanied by Weitzrichen, Weitz, Weitzrich, Weitzrich, on patrol of German-held territory. So Weitzrich was his co-pilot. At just 25 years old, the Baron was already a German national hero. Keep that in mind because if that's the case, many people will believe anything, almost anything, about the accomplishments of a national hero. How's it going to be debated? So, I wonder, you know, exaggeration could take place. Anyways, story goes, the patrol was going normally for around an hour, perfectly clear skies, visibility was good. The pilot saw a large metallic disc ringed by orange lights directly in front of him. Waitrick later estimated again, 80 years later, that it was almost 150 feet across, over 100 feet wider than their own planes. The next thing, Waitrick realized the Baron was firing on the craft. According to Waitrick, it hit the disc, directly causing it to go down like a rock, crashing into the woods, shearing off tree limbs as it did. As the pilots looked at the crippled craft below, they saw two little bald-headed guys emerge from the wreckage before they disappeared into the woods. When they returned to the base, both men made an official report, but they were informed to never speak of the incident to anyone. After eight decades and no longer in the military, Waitrick finally decided to spo- speak about the incident. Here's my question about that. And I've had this for a long time, so I'm just putting this out there. When we break it down, how could a measly First World War era machine gun damage an alien spacecraft, a supposedly advanced alien spacecraft. Mind you, they traveled through space. Micro debris, micrometeorites, all these things, those are real things. The radiation, we're talking about real serious dangers, according to NASA and everybody else about space and how dangerous space is. But yet they come down to Earth and they get taken out by First World War machine gun? You know what it could damage? Another terrestrial craft made by an early 1900s government. Right? To me, that makes more sense than an alien craft. But again, we don't know. That's why it's fun. And even in UFO circles, this one is a little flimsy. But I love it because I love all the 
No, I mean, it's a German ace pilot shooting down a UFO during wartime. What's not to love? It's amazing. Waitrick said initially they believed the object was an experimental aircraft of the U.S., which was only weeks away from entering the war. So, Waitrick initially, right after the sighting, said it was an experimental craft. Uh, But then decades later, 80 years later, Waitrick said it looked like those saucer-shaped spaceships that everyone's been seeing for the past 50 years. And there was no doubt in his mind that what he he and the Baron saw that morning was a spacecraft from another planet and that the two crew were aliens. Why the switch? 80 years later. Because that's the narrative. In World War I, there was no UFO alien narrative. There was no Roswell. There was no government plan. So he was calling it as he saw it. It wasn't alien. It was experimental, meaning terrestrial. And then 80 years later, what happens? Well, he gets UFO researchers that are now feeding him the narrative, saying, are you sure it wasn't alien? It could have been alien. Look at all these other sightings. Look at all this. Look at all this. And they're feeding his brain. So then now all of a sudden he's going, oh, well, uh, yeah, I guess so. Leading the witness, as opposed to in the initial sighting, he called it the way he saw it, experimental graft. So I still think it's that. More sightings. In the early 1914, off the coast of Ontario, Canada, on the Georgian Bay, eight people reported seeing an object floating on the water with several figures on top of the object putting some kind of hose into the water. When the entity saw the witnesses watching them, they quickly scurried inside the craft that rose in the air and took off. Several weeks later, later according to a letter from a witness published in the Sufos uh, associate letter, this C-U-F-O-S. So like MUFON, MUFON, but SUFOS. The witness, or maybe it's KUFOS, hard C. The witness was at a local trash dump when he noticed a musical humming sound. When he looked in the direction of the sound, he saw a machine-like disc-shaped object with a dome top hovering at short distance above the fence. Then several humanoid beings with round heads emerged from the craft, emerged from the craft, but then quickly withdrew and took off. Why would an advanced alien race scurry away from primitive humans? Even in 2023, Primitive humans compared to an advanced alien race that can travel through the cosmos to reach us. Like, oh no, we spotted the humans. The humans spotted us. Oh no. Like what? Why? Who cares? Unless we're dealing with the prime directive type situation. Where... They have traveled the cosmos looking for new civilizations. And then, in that case, they might want to not interact with humans. But then, wouldn't you think they'd be more careful? But then you can go back to Star Trek and you could be like, well, they weren't as careful as they could have been in there and they had the prime directive. They held the whole Federation down for the thing. So, I mean, they they still fucked up. Oh, yeah, they did. Humans be humans, man. So that's what makes me wonder, are aliens like humans? Or are we projecting our humanness onto what we think aliens would be? Mm. In Lore, France, around the same time, 4 a.m., Mr. Perrette was asleep at home when he felt something tap him on the back. Dude, I would freak the fuck out. 
When he turned around, he was shocked to see a white-faced, glistening, humanoid figure wearing a shiny one-piece, approximately the height of a 10-year-old child standing behind him. Okay. A white-faced, glistening, humanoid figure in a one-piece that was about a 10-year-old. That sounds like a pedo dream from Herbert the Pervert from Family Guy. You know what I mean? Why did I? Why did, that didn't work the way I wanted to. Guess who? There it went. <laughs> Fuck. A disc-like object was seen during the day in Sweden by a 15-year-old. And at the same time, a round greenish object was reported hovering near nil, uh, eh, near a hillside in St. Leonard de Nablot in France. Rose into the air, disappeared at great speed. Also around the same time, several cigar-shaped objects were seen moving over Ukraine. And another sighting of a disc-shaped craft in the middle of the day was reported in Lyon in Spain. According to the files of Josep Guijarro, at around 6 p.m. on February 5th in Chenko, Chile, multiple people saw a meteor-shaped object moving at great speed across the sky, leaving a white smoky trail behind it. Why wasn't it a meteor? It's just a meteor. It's a meteor-shaped object leaving a meteor-like trail. If it talks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So this is a fucking meteor, is it not? In March 1914, in Le Jamard, Haute Vienne, France, according to the research of Jean Mesnard and Jean-Marie Bijon, a farmer was going home when he saw a luminous green object hovering above the ground a short distance away. He approached the craft, and when he was around 300 feet away from it, he saw several figures around the size of a small child walking around the immediate vicinity of the object before hurrying back inside. A moment later, the object rose in the air, took off with a zigzag trajectory, disappearing within seconds. Could that be the case of tiny humans, tiny future humans? Could it be the case of autonomous drone-type creatures? I mean, look, we're... We have all kinds of unmanned drone technology. Now we've got drone dogs. How long before we got drone midgets running around? Just drone midgets going, I represent the lollipop guild. Right? Could very much be. According to the research of Ted Blocher... Blochar in early May 1914 at around 10 a.m. just outside Farmsville, Texas. Teenager Silby Latham with his older brothers Sid and Clude. <laughs> it's probably Claude. We're in nearby fields with the family's two pet dogs, Bob and Fox. Oh, I love those names, Bob and Fox. I love it. Chopping cotton when they heard a deathly howl from their dogs. They immediately ran to the sound where they found the dogs had cornered a little man near one of the fences. Suddenly, the dogs attacked, tearing the poor thing limb from limb. Damn. Again, no wonder aliens are going to fuck us up if that was an alien. My question is, if it was me, as morbid as this might sound, if it was me and I had some dogs that tore a little man apart. I would look at the remains to see what kind of a little man it was. Was it really a little man? Was it a squirrel? Was it a, what, what was it? And I would want to put that in my, if I'm going to report that my dogs tore a man from limb to limb, I'm going to let them know, but it wasn't a real man. It was a little man, like an alien. But that's just me. Several weeks later, in Bilda, Algeria, according to a French UFO forum, a French settler making his way home after irrigating his fields 
when a brightly glowing sphere appeared overhead and landed a short distance away from him. Unsure of what it was, he quickly got behind a large hedge at the side of the field and watched several small figures emerge from the sphere, each wearing a tight one-piece suit and a helmet on their heads. Here's my other question. Why are every single one of these wearing a uniform? Every single one. Aside, of course, from the red fur little guys. and the, So almost every single one. Most of them are wearing a unitard, a leotard, a uniform of some kind, a onesie, a baby onesie. I don't know. But Why? Why do all aliens have uniforms? Why do they all wear coveralls? Is that not a human thing? They're all humanoid. They're all wearing some kind of helmet. They're all wearing some kind of suit. Man, this is just screaming future humans to me. Really is. And and I'll be honest with you, if people are wondering, well, then how come we don't get a lot of them now? Because I wouldn't give a fuck about the people now. I mean, look at look at the people on TikTok. My God, I would not want to interact with us either. So I, I if it was me, I'd want to go back to an older time. And maybe something happened back then. Maybe the fun, something in the first world wars happened that changed the trajectory of human of human nature, humankind. And so they're they're going back to these key moments in history, checking them out for themselves, seeing what happened. Maybe, I don't know, clearing up history, changing history, who knows. Also, in the early summer of 1914, at around 4 a.m. in Hamburg, Germany, Gustav Herwagen saw a glow coming from outside and went to investigate. As he opened the door, he could see a shining cigar-shaped object that had illuminated windows along the side. In the vicinity of the object, he saw several small figures, around four feet tall, wearing the same light-colored clothing. Not sensing any danger, he approached them. However, as he was within several feet of them, they hurried inside the craft and took off. Again, why would they be afraid of humans unless they were directly told not to interact with humans or something like that. That's what I'm thinking, some kind of prime directive type activity. Then World War I starts and sightings continue. August 2nd in Kino near uh, Strizhov in Russia, two local peasant women working in a field saw two odd-looking figures in another field short distance away wearing the same style of red suit moving something gray that was on the ground in front of them. Sensing they might be in danger, the two women ran away. On the same day, around the same time, other woman, another woman claimed that something big and dark passed over her head in the direction of the field where the two figures were seen. Several days later, in southern Kasnamilf, in Ural, Russia, multiple local residents reported seeing mysterious flying machines one of them landing just outside the village, two occupants clearly visible. One of the locals fired a gun at the visitors. Not a good idea, but it didn't appear to have an effect. After several moments, the object took off. So, my question is, they scurry from eyeballs but not bullets? Like, oh no, the humans have spotted us. We got to get out. But the moment they shoot at them, it's like no big deal. I don't get it. Just over two weeks later, August 23rd, in Severnake, New South Wales, in Australia, two young boys saw a strange flying vehicle, something they had never seen moving in a way they were not familiar with. Again, you're talking about young kids in 1914 who have probably never seen an aircraft, let alone familiar with the way it moves. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm hard pressed to say aliens. It literally could have been anything. Around a week after that, according to a report by Mervy Vertinen, 10-year-old Arvo Kapula 
was with his grandmother, Maria Falt, at the family farmhouse in Alastaro, Finland, when the sun went dark and they heard a blowing sound. Then a sudden blast of light hit up the far, uh, lit up the farmhouse when Maria and Arvo looked out the window. They could see a large shining globe heading in their direction, stopping a short distance from the house. An oval window opened on the side of the object, revealing two male humanoid figures inside, but with large heads. Avro got scared and asked, What if the men got inside? She assured him they wouldn't. They just had a message for them. Maria claims that some kind of communication took place between her and these visitors, followed by a bright flash and the object moving away from the property. Interesting. You know, and, and again, I asked the question, why that lady? And what was the message? You're not going to give us the message? Damn you, woman. At around 3.30 a.m. on uh, September 23rd in Astrakhan, region of Russia, Vasilya Sokolov was returning home from a business trip on his horse. Holy shit. If there's ever a statement that hammered home the time period we're in, guys, that's it. A business trip on his horse. He's a business guy riding a horse. So when we talk about rural and we talk about not having access or seeing technology, that's a good point right there. That's a good example. So the, the businessman on his trip, uh, on his horse coming home, noticed a bright star-like object overhead. As he watched the object further, he realized it was getting larger. And the closer it got, the more he could clearly see a cylindrical shape with a brown exterior and a bright light on what he assumed was the front of it. As it got even closer, Sokolov could see there was a compartment of sorts on the underside where he could see six shadowy figures. Five sitting on one, five sitting and one standing. At this point, Sokolov freaked out and ran the rest of the way to his house, screaming to whoever was in the house to turn off the lights so it didn't attract the craft. Then he was temporarily blinded by a bright beam of light that projected to the ground in front of him from the craft. A moment later, the object changed direction, facing away from the property. As the brightness dimmed, Sokolov could see the object was moving away from him. It remained visible for around 10 minutes before finally leaving. And, and again, my question is, this is a man who, again, riding a horse, riding a horse does not have a vehicle, does not have a car. So I'm assuming has never seen an aircraft or at least not up close, I would think. How would he know? I mean, compartment of sorts is what he's saying. It's just, look, when we don't know about something, it's so abstract that when you try and later describe something that, I mean, I've said this a lot, try describing a piece of paper to someone that doesn't know what paper is. It's, you would have to describe the entire process of cutting down a tree, how the tree becomes a piece of paper to explain what a piece of paper is. You can't just go, look, it's a piece of paper. You can't just show them a piece of paper. Now to us, it's the, one of the most mundane, ordinary things you could show almost a a baby, a child, a, a piece of paper with having almost no reference to, to the rest of the world, and they would know to draw on it. Why? Because our world is so, it's such a, a common thing in our world that everyone knows what it is. You don't have to explain what a piece of paper is. You just know that you can write on it. Even a child that doesn't know where paper comes from knows they can write and draw on paper. So in in a world where this is not common, 
Flying things are not common. And flying things with compartments are not common. The abstract nature of this man trying to describe what he saw, I, I cannot believe that he would describe it as a craft. Well, maybe a craft, but like the compartments and the fig, I just, I have a hard time. But again, I'm not those people. I don't know what they knew. So I'm assuming, but I think a lot of people assume a lot of things in these cases. They assume that these people know what these things might be. Instead of assuming that they don't, because I think it's more likely they don't have any idea what these things are. So I don't know. Another sighting just before 4 a.m. on December 6th, just outside Cochabamba in Bolivia. David Mendiola Vilches was walking up by what sounded like, or woken up, I'm sorry, he was woken up by what sounded like a low-flying airplane. Concerned it might crash, he quickly made his way outside, but instead of an airplane, he could see a large metal cigar-shaped object descending into one of the fields. As he approached the craft, out of nowhere, he was encased in a tube of bright light. Then a moment later, he was inside the craft with no memory of how he got there. All around him were monstrous beings with pale skin covered in a mucus-like substance (coughs) with large heads and large eyes. That's some freaky shit. Their legs at least according to Vilchez, appeared almost like the tentacles of an octopus. He could recall some kind of examination taking place. Then the next thing he remembered, he was standing outside his home. The object and the beings gone. Gone. That one is obviously the... Most outrageous out of all of them. I don't mean outrageous as in not possible. I just mean outrageous as in outrageous. First one that we've seen where they weren't exactly humanoid. Tentacles. Mucus. Gross. The thing is. We can speculate whether these are aliens or not. If the crafts are alien or not. If these sightings even happened or not. Like I said before. If due to the early stage of technology in 1914, it's mistaken identity, superstition. A lot of that's all rolling around. Keep that all in mind. At around 9 p.m., On September 15th in Alta, Norway, the dark skies were lit up by some kind of unexplained luminous phenomenon. And multiple people from across the area saw a huge star that appeared out of nowhere and moved across the sky. Although this object was white for the most part, it did occasionally occasionally and briefly flicker to shades of blue and red. Have you guys ever seen a star do that? We have a star. I don't know if it's a star, I guess. I don't know what it is. But above our house, every time on my way home from work, I see it. And I always look at it because it appears to be flickering. And not just flickering white, but what appears to be white and red and a little bit of blue. And I don't know what it is. I always assume it's just me. But that's what that makes me think of. Eventually, it disappeared into the distance, leaving those who saw it totally confused. Another possible airship sighting happened over Norway several weeks later, November 21st, in Tjolta. According to the report in a local newspaper, the craft was seen near the Skjavr lighthouse, lighting up the building with a powerful searchlight. When it was seen, first seen, The airship was just over 2,000 feet above the ground, although at one point it came as close as 1,500 feet. It moved over the city 
for several minutes before rising into the air and eventually disappearing. My biggest question is, as I pointed out numerous times, how? How can you gauge 2,000 feet above the ground? 2,000 feet. When have those people in Saskatchewan in 1914 ever been to 2,000 feet above the ground and know that? Maybe mountain climbing, maybe, but I mean, it's, it's so hard, even with the familiarity of aircraft, how they fly, how high they can go. It's, it's, this is from pilots. It is almost impossible to determine how high something is from on the ground. So when people do this, oh, it was over 2,000 feet above the ground. I, how? How did you determine that? One, you don't know how big the thing is. Two, you can't, based on that, you can't determine how far away it is if you don't know how big it is. That's the whole reason why we can determine how far away a plane is. We know how large a 747 is, a Cessna is. So you can go like, oh, that's a small prop plane. It must be around this far away. Not that we're going to be able to go like 2,000 feet or whatever the fuck. And now you're talking about people that don't even know flight. Come on. Come on. That is such a guess. And those are the types of things that I talk about when I'm saying like adding details into your story that don't need to be there. Because you can't possibly know. You couldn't possibly know that. I don't think so anyways. That's me. I don't think so. That's what throws me off right away. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Please tell me I'm wrong. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be misled. I said that right in the beginning. I don't want to be duped. I don't want to be duped by my own stupidity either. Like, hey, you don't know this. You should know this. So please tell me. So now we're going to move further into the war. A little bit. We're getting towards the end of this here. But as the fighting intensified, mainly in Europe, reports still keep coming in. Keep in mind, again, this is wartime. So during this time, entire nations are on high alert. People are getting bombed. In Canada, several reports appeared in newspapers around the country of phantom invaders, aerial vehicles that made their way over cities as if performing some kind of survey of the area. Around the same time in Puglia, Italy, Despite no reports of aerial craft, there was a report of a group of locals capturing a little green man. And another in Devonshire, England, when a local woman claimed to have seen a tiny green colored man wearing a red cap burst out of some bushes while she was walking, then disappeared back into the bushes. Around the same time in Jogate, Las Villas, Cuba, Two men were riding around the perimeters of their sugar cane field when their horses got spooked and they refused to go forward. As the two men scanned their area, they noticed something on the ground ahead of them, a white sack, only it appeared to be alive. The two men were getting closer for a moment longer before realizing it was heading toward them. One of the men raised his rifle and fired at the object several times. The more he fired and hit it, the more or the uh, the bigger it got. Ultimately, the men realized they were in over their heads and left the scene immediately. There are plenty of cases that I have not gone over. From early 1900s to the end of World War I. The final years of the First World War, all of it. This is just a handful of cases. And I, and I know a lot of these, you know, I'm, I'm big on details and all that. And this had very, very little details. But I think it goes to reinforce the fact that people will report things whether they know what they are or not. 
And a lot of times I think it's just people wanting to get it out there so somebody might hopefully answer the question. Not necessarily to make it out like, well, it was for sure alien or it was for sure otherworldly, but just being like, I saw something weird. I don't know what it is. I'm just putting it out there in the ether. Hopefully somebody knows. Maybe that's what it is. I love looking back at these old sightings and trying to put myself in the shoes of the people in that world and the world the state was in at the time. The lack of technology, the war, the paranoia, the superstition. It's fascinating to see what people were thinking when they were seeing these things. I think... In my opinion, I think a lot of times these stories are later potentially changed to make them sound more otherworldly or whatever by people that want to believe that. Whereas I think in a lot of cases, like in the case of the Red Baron, they, he initially said experimental craft. 80 years later, flipped on it. Why? The narrative, in my opinion. In these reports, many of the people are considered credible and responsible members of society like police officers, judges, businessmen, whatever you want, professionals of all areas. This is where I get hung up because people are people. And it is human nature to exaggerate. It is human nature to glorify, sometimes to lie. Or if nothing else, for our eyes to deceive us. And I'm not saying these people are liars. I'm not saying they're not credible. Most of them aren't even named. It's just witnesses this and local person that. What's credible from an anonymous report? There's no names. What's there to go over? Like I pointed out earlier, what's scientific to go over? What's there to break down scientifically that you could look at? Nothing. It's just fun stories. And in my opinion, that's the way it should be looked at as fun stories. I want to believe in this stuff. I want to believe. I believe these people were seeing something. But was it new technology from humans being tested at a time when when flight was just being implemented? Or is it aliens? As I said before, there's no argument, no argument from me that these are indeed UFOs and UAPs, whatever you want to call them, unidentified aerial phenomenon or unidentified flying objects. That's what they are. Not arguing that. I'm arguing. How does that translate to aliens? And if it is aliens, why Earth and why humans? As I continue to repeat. Why humans? Why aliens? Or why Earth, I mean. And the time frame. Is it, is it, uh, could it be future travelers? Time travelers. Could it be? Mm, I love that one. I don't know. I want to believe in all of it, man. I want to believe in all of it. But you know what I want to know? I want to know what you all think. I want to know if you have stories. I want to know if you have experiences. I want you to just reach out, call or text 208-477-1288. You can email, I want to believe, 115 at gmail.com. And every single episode is brought to you by... The Tinfoil Militia members who support this podcast. Here they are, ladies and gentlemen. I believe I see militia forming. 
tin foil. Militia. Stop, militia. The tin foil. Militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. Hey, yeah. Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Rihanna Little, the OG supporter designer, tin foil hat wearing Aaron Rice. Jesse, Jet Life Teague, Michael Benavides, Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt, Morgan, Nathan Boldly Gone Higby, who's out there in the field chasing down leads on Blind Mike, and of course, our very own Edwin Everhart, who is not with us today. We love you, Ed. He's uh, adulting again. He's got extermination to do at his house, wrapping shit up, trying to get the bugs out, I guess. Bummer, man. You know, he's got a wonderful house, bought this house not too long ago, great house, it's just, it's a little bit older. It's a little bit of a fixer-upper, and sometimes you got to get rid of the bugs. You know what I mean? So he's off doing adulting shit while we have fun. Um, that's it, everybody. That's it. I want you to click that link in the show notes. The portal to all things UFO know to donate, buy merch, listen to all the episodes and more, do a whole bunch of stuff. Make sure to check out our partners, Clarkston CBD Company, for excellent CBD products. I'm telling you, we got the best people. We got the best. Scribed. Great Audible alternative. Don't spend that $14.95 at uh, Audible. Spend it on Scribe. Don't, you don't need a credit. You get to keep it. It's great. It's phenomenal. I love it. And of course, Buzzsprout. Start your own podcast. Do it. You're going to love it. It's so much fun. And use our link. Get that $20 uh, gift card from Amazon. Of course, now buy us a Romulan Ale. Click that link in the description. Do it. I want somebody to do it. Buy us a Romulan Ale so we can toast to you on the show. We want to do it. It'd be so, so much fun. And of course, join the growing list of tin foilists, the tin foil militia. Get ad free episodes, rewards for tier members, chat with us directly on Discord, get access to bonus episodes each and every single week, plus all my loyalty. And I'm going to be adding some new stuff. Uh, it's going to be happening, people. Bonus episodes and all that great jazz. It's going to be happening. We're adding some stuff. Remember, sharing is caring. So spread a slight gossip. Just take that URL, slap it anywhere you want. Get merch. Be a tinfoilist. Join the cool kids. And remember, stay elevated. Keep your eyes to the skies and watch out for the government. They're shysty bastards. We'll see you next week.